Welcome to this online service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Waynesboro for Sunday, February 13th, 2022. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, our board made the decision last month to discontinue in-person services for the time being and return to this online format. We do this out of concern for the health and well-being of our members and a larger community. While the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is surging and putting great stress on the limits of our healthcare system and workers. My name is Kay Yost and I'm a member of this fellowship and serve on our worship arts team. This Sunday marks the beginning of our annual pledge drive here at UUFW. So this is a good time to be reminded of the final bullet point in our mission statement calling us to invest in the future of our fellowship through personally significant commitments of our time, talents, and resources. I also find it a good time to reflect on why I joined this fellowship roughly 10 years ago. I joined out of a desire to be in relationship with people in my local community and become involved in community service. I was drawn to Unitarian Universalism as it is a faith that allows for a diversity of belief and welcomes all without regard for gender or sexual orientation. And it's based on the first principle of the inherent worth and dignity of every person. If you are a visitor here, I want to welcome you and thank you for spending time with us in this online format and invite you to come visit us in person whenever services resume in our physical space in Waynesboro. For additional information about the fellowship, you can visit our website at uufw.org. Also, contact information and details on how to donate are provided at the end of this video. The flaming chalice is a symbol of our faith, and every Sunday we light a chalice at the beginning of our service. In keeping with this tradition, I now share these words before the lighting of the chalice. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other.
Our words of prayer today are words which I composed a few years ago. North, south, east, and west, angel visible ahead of me, angels hidden by forests around me, and everywhere the holy, the ultimate. Angels created by our ingenuity, desire, and prayers. Angels imagined in concrete absence. And a deep, stirring call to me, to us, to be the angel. To be the angels the world needs. To be the angel the person near us needs to give the message of hope, to stay the hand of carelessness or evil. When the hill we are climbing in the snow at the end of a long day shows us no angel towering over forest and freeway, may we be emboldened, may we muster the strength of resolve. May we learn to be messengers of peace, bearers of good tidings, protectors of those unable to protect themselves and allies of those who have found their agency. May we be people who create or bolster a path of security and sufficiency. May we learn to be the angel. Among the joys of our fellowship this morning, Tom Engel writes, my joy is that my family was able to celebrate my dad's 100th birthday last month. Unfortunately, due to Omicron, we had to cancel a big party at a local inn that we had been planning for several months. However, a small group of 13 brave souls, some from as far away as Argentina, Oregon, and Massachusetts gathered at my house as COVID safely as we were able and made it an event fitting to the amazing occasion. The guest of honor was just fine with the scaled back nature of the party. I'm so proud of my dad for reaching this awesome milestone. We feel joy together with Tom. It is a joy to me that Walter's follow-up visit to his orthopedic surgeon this past Wednesday resulted in the report that his hip is 100% healed from the break and the surgery. And so what remains is ongoing therapy and the continual dealing of what life presents to us. And it is with sorrow that I share that my senior ministerial colleague, the Reverend Jean Pupke, who supported my ministry and offered the invocation at my service of installation here six years ago today, received major injuries from a fall last Sunday, which then led to her death on Wednesday. Reverend Jean was a major force within our movement and will leave a hole that goes far beyond Richmond or Virginia. Let us hold these and all unspoken joys and sorrows of this fellowship in our hearts together in a time of silence.
Sustaining the Tree of Life by Lynn Gardner The tree stood in the middle of the village. Its trunk was so large that it took six people holding hands to reach around it. The roots were strong and wide, and its branches spread out over the village square, offering shelter from the rain or shade from the summer sun. Its fruit was juicy, sweet, and plentiful. The people of the village loved the tree. Children played beneath it and climbed its lowest branches. Young people knew that if you whispered your dreams to the tree, they were more likely to come true. People who proclaimed their love or friendship for one another beneath its branches found their relationships to be nourishing, and elders discovered that their sweetest memories could be counted on when they were near the great tree. The tree had been witness to so much, and when the breezes blew through the leaves, one could hear echoes of generations. Laughter, conversations, dreams, prayers, and songs. Animals loved the tree, too. Rabbits lived in burrows under the roots, squirrels and monkeys lived in the branches, and bats and birds flew in to eat the abundant fruit. The tree seemed to buzz with life. One day, a traveling merchant arrived in the village. He rested in the shade and ate two pieces of delicious fruit. This fruit is incredible, he said. I would like to have some to sell in the next villages I visit. Who owns this tree? No one owns this tree, replied a villager. If anything, we belong to it. Well, then if no one owns the tree, then no one will mind if I pick the fruit, said the merchant, and he began to fill a basket. I mind, said the villager, and today I am the keeper of the tree. What do you mean, keeper of the tree? We each take our turn being here with the tree, said the villager. We could never own it. We are here as protectors, as sustainers. That's ridiculous. This tree doesn't need you. You could just take what you need, take what you want. The tree will continue. But the villager couldn't be persuaded. Sir, this tree isn't like that. We don't come here to take from it, even though we receive much. We're keepers of the tree because this is where we are nourished. This is where some of our most precious memories are, and where our people have dreamed. This is where we remember who we want to become. 
Well, said the merchant, you may think that this tree is very special, but it still doesn't need you to sit here with it. That's preposterous. Ah, replied the villager, the tree itself may not need me. But what of others who come by? Just this morning I sat with a woman whose heart was heavy with worry. Had I not been here, she would have had to carry that weight alone. And this afternoon, a tired couple came by, and they rested with me. They said they had been looking for a place like this. And then an elder came by, and we watched the birds and the branches together. And now you are here. You are confused about what this tree is and how to be with it. Imagine if you had arrived and not found anyone here to talk with. You might have continued thinking that everything you do is all about you. Luckily for you, my friend, I'm here to let you know that when you care for the tree of life, it becomes so much more than just you. And the merchant sat for a while in the shade, thinking about these ideas that felt new and a little challenging. As the sun went down, he picked up his bag and headed out of town, whistling a song that he hadn't thought of in years. On his way, he shared a smile with each person he met, his heart feeling strangely light and joyful. And the people of the village? They continued to sustain the tree of life, to care for one another and to share their gifts with grace and gratitude. In 1960, the year I was born, Theodore Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, published a picture book titled, Oh, the Places You'll Go. It has become quite popular to reference or read from, 
at high school and college graduations because it is all about taking charge of one's own destiny, using one's brains and bodies and ingenuity and drive to go wherever and do whatever one is driven toward. You have brains in your head and feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you are the guy who'll decide where to go. It is a wonderful motivational promise of a book to encourage young people who have completed one level of preparation to go forth on the journey of adult life where there is no one who is going to make a lot of those life decisions for them or take responsibility for their success or well-being or indeed their failure anymore. It is a moment presented as wide with opportunity. That's the theory, of course though those of us who are adults and have been for some years realize that that is only part of the story, that sometimes there are restricting factors that prevent us from doing something we are otherwise prepared for and inclined to do. Sometimes what we yearn for is beyond what we may ever have the opportunity to grasp, but applying our preparation our abilities, our training, is an important part of how we can play a role in shaping our own lives and the world around us. I'm thinking of, oh, the places you'll go today because this Sunday marks the kickoff of a month or so of this year's pledge drive here at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Waynesboro. And our Pledge Drive Task Force has chosen as the theme for this year's effort, imagine what we can be. We're a group of intelligent, capable people. We have brains in our heads and feet in our shoes. So we are called on to make a decision about the ways we can and choose to participate in shaping and living the life of this fellowship. Imagine what we can be. What is important, not just to you or to me individually, but what is important to the value this congregation adds to our lives, to our community, and to the family of humanity? And what will we need to do to move toward that goal, that destination? What do you imagine we can be? How are you driven to participate and share in the responsibility for our own community, for our own congregation? What things can you do that maybe no one else is prepared to do? What things can we do together? We are at a time of challenge. When members who gave and participated through the years have died or moved away at a somewhat faster rate than new members have joined. So where are there gaps that we need to decide how and whether we can fill them to grow and maintain the life of this congregation. Inevitably, a pledge drive seems to focus on money because it is the source of financial planning information to help the board decide what is possible in the next fiscal year, among the many things that have a monetary component. And yes, things there are things that we do that have little or no monetary component, but yet there are also quite a few things that require some financial input. 
However, pledge season isn't really about money per se. Our pledge drive is really about how and what shape we are willing and able to imagine our fellowship becoming in the next 12 months. Pledge season is a time for taking stock of what future we want our fellowship to have and what we realistically are prepared to contribute toward that future. The leaders of this congregation will never ever ask you to put yourself in financial jeopardy in order to fill, to fill fellowship coffers. It just won't happen. That is not according to our values or our aims. We ask that you imagine and that you evaluate. What is important to you? Why does this fellowship matter? How do you want to give and how can you contribute? How does the money or the absence of money fit into your total picture of engagement and participation in the life of the congregation? We have to have a dollar figure to fit into our budgeting equation, but that isn't the point of pledging. In the past few years, I have each year in pledge season told you the amount of my pledge so that you know that I am in this with you so that you will know that although I am paid by the fellowship, I also participate in the life of the congregation. This time I'm not quite able to tell you what I will pledge because of new expenses drawing against my household income. But I too am a member of this fellowship and have to go through the same decision making and evaluation process that you have to do in pledge season each year. And it is complicated for all of us to make such calculations and commit to such plans essentially a year in advance. Whatever you give, the process will not be easy. And this time around, we all are dealing with inflation at levels we hadn't seen since when, the 1970s? And the fellowship, too, faces the same pressures of inflation. The, fellowship need, uh, the fellowship's need will be higher right now just when things are tighter all around. How can we fit this reality together with what we imagine the future of this fellowship to be? Some may not be able to increase their pledge. It's just not realistic. It's not safe or prudent, while others perhaps will feel fewer inflationary pressures and might choose to increase their pledge. Whichever is true for you, you will not be judged on your decisions. This is indeed very personal and it is part of the communal life of this congregation. Dr. Seuss's optimistic look at possibilities as one starts out also recognizes a variety of factors that come into play. Sometimes there's a slump, sometimes you're left in the lurch, and sometimes you find yourself when there are risks of spraining elbow or chin, sometimes there are places of just waiting it out. Do you dare to go out? Do you dare to stay in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? Pledge time, budgeting time, decision making time is always a challenge. There are always risks, always unknowns. 
Disappointments of various sizes and shapes are going to be part of the process, but we still have possibilities. What do you imagine we can be in this coming year? What will our fellowship look like as we forge a path amid the challenges of our day? And now you are here. You were confused about what this tree is and how to be with it. Imagine if you had arrived and not found anyone here to talk with. You might have continued thinking that everything you do is all about you, is only about you. But luckily for you, my friend, I'm here to let you know that when you care for the tree of life, it becomes about so much more than just you. Let us hold the possibility up to the light of community, the cost of this decision, or that up to the value of this congregation adds to the lives of the people of the congregation, but also to the world around us. Let us make holy choices, whatever they are and need to be. Amen, and blessed be. Please join me in singing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Love will guide us, peace has tried us, hope inside us will lead the way. On the road from greed to giving, you can change the world with your love. If you cannot sing like angels if you cannot speak before thousands you can give from deep within you you can change the world with your love you are like no other being what you can no other can give to the future of our precious children, to the future of the world where we live. Love.